Hello, thank you all for coming. I'll let everyone take a seat and we'll get started. Today we're here to talk about from many to one, migrating disparate sites into a single cohesive Drupal platform. Um, you'll be hearing from myself, an account manager and proposal specialist at Promit Source, as well as my colleague. Hi, I'm John Lutz. I'm a senior uh, Drupal developer. Been with Promit for almost five years, working with Drupal exclusively for about 15. So Promit builds both federal and local government websites. We are versed in higher education sites as well. And we work to really maintain long lasting relationships with our clients, a few of whom you can see here. Um, I'll let people take a seat, sorry. So we're gonna start out by introducing two of our local government clients to you. Um, so one of them here you'll see is Orange County, California. And they were struggling with vendor lock-in when we were approached by them. Um, and we ended up migrating them all to a single Drupal instance, which John will talk more about here in a moment. Um, but you can see here some of their, their challenges and their goals. And next we have Riverside County. And they were actually working with mixed environments um, and we were working to bring all of those into a single Drupal instance for them. And they were also looking for support, assistance with mul uh, sorry, multiple mobile applications and integrations as well as strategic marketing advice. They were seeking a modern CMS that would help them grow and scale, much like Orange County in the slide before. Important to both was the aspect of security and compliance and the ability to grow and scale, as I mentioned a moment ago. So these are the essential objectives. I've hit on a couple of these. Um, you know, one of the things that's key to all of the organizations we work with is ease of use not only for the internal users, um, but also for those who are visiting the site. We want to be able to have a clean design and realize cost efficiencies with the efficiency of the site itself. Some of the challenges I'm sure many of you are familiar with is dealing with content that's dispersed and disorganized and has to be revamped as you go along. Um, migrating from multiple different platforms as well as from proprietary platforms um, and potentially not always having the access you need to exactly the information you need. And I'm going to hand this over to John to discuss the solutions that we came up with to deal with some of these problems for our clients. Thank you, Amy. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I'm gonna be talking about each. Um, so I'm just gonna start to give you an overview of some of the solutions that we came up with for some of the pain points that she kind of brought up in the earlier slides. I am gonna go into detail on kind of each one of these bullets. So, so one of the solutions was that we needed a detailed roadmap for, uh, and a plan for groups of websites to launch uh, in waves. Um, uh, we needed a migration plan with clear milestones uh, we ended up deciding to use a multi-site with common code base and common features, uh, an architecture with common government, content types and views, a componentized building block content editing system for flexibility, a countywide search and individual site search, and one enterprise level theme with multiple theme variations for sites to choose from, a migration strategy to scrape pages and pull in the most current information, and a vigilant project management and client governance. So 
So I'm gonna go into each kind of one of those. So a detailed roadmap. Of course, we have a plan for websites, right? Um, for these projects though, it was really crucial that all the stu stakeholders knew what was coming and can be prepared uh, for what was coming down the line for their timelines. Um, because like we were saying, we both of these counties had, uh, one of them had like 40 sites and the other one had like um, 70 sites. So there was a lot of stakeholders involved here to manage. So having a clear plan for all of them to see in the beginning and all the way through uh, was really helpful to keep people on the same page and keep it going smoothly so we didn't mess up the timelines. Um, so also there, we decided to, uh, there was a design committee that represented um, all the county stakeholders uh, that we included in an initial discovery. So that really helped with the process later on so that the, uh, when we got to the individual stakeholders of some, a lot of the departments, um, the initial uh, core group are the ones that kind of dictated what was in scope in the design, and then we could refer back to them so they went, we didn't get off track when we got into to the uh, separate departments and their wants and needs. Um, like I said, we did decide to use, um, we decided to launch these websites in groups, and um, that helped a lot to basically reduce the set of people that we were dealing with at one time uh, as we were moving sites. Um, if you would imagine trying to do all the sites um, over a longer period of time, um, that's gonna be a lot of people talking and a lot more people for us to manage. So deciding to do it in waves really helped out. Um, uh, sorry. So each wave also had very well established repeatable procedures that as we went from wave to wave, we knew what we were doing on our side and we can present it to them and they it kept them kind of uh, involved and, and moving on to the next step. So each wave, basically, we had another little mini discovery with that wave and we discussed um, basically they could t walk us through their website and how it was gonna, we could show them what system we were going into and how it was gonna translate into that new system, what was gonna happen during the migration steps. Um, and then we could outline maybe areas that, that might be a problem area, there might be something that we need to look uh, to do some custom work for that particular department. But we could identify early on, you know, get them up to speed for us to know what was happening. Then we also had weekly meetings with them to also keep them on track during their wave. We gave them multiple UAT checkpoints so they could once again be involved and stay focused during this little process. Um, eventually they had trainings uh, in the system and documentation maybe like two thirds of the way through uh, their wave and then they went on and edited their content to get it ready for launch and then we launched their sites. So kind of spoke to this earlier, but basically broadly, we have, for Orange, there's about 41 sites, Riverside about 71. We had, each of these waves is about six weeks long. Um, the initial wave, like the beginning of it, was a little bit longer so that we could build like the system that they're gonna go into. And then we have, once again, smaller waves of just five or six websites at a time. Um, for a total of about 18 months for both projects. So onto the architecture of these platforms. So we decided, decided to create separate sites with a common code base and a common feature set. Uh, for Orange County, it was a traditional multi-site. For Riverside County, um, they were actually already contracted to use uh, Acquia Site Factory. So that's what we use, Base same basic concept though just slightly different ways of managing the deployments and some of the setup was different. Um, so we decided to create a small set of essential types, content types that all the sites would need based on our experience with government clients. Um, this small set would give them a greater, a great start with our limited amount of development time in the first wave. Then in future waves, given more time and requirements, we could build in more unique content types. So we started out with a fairly 
basic system of just basic page news, events, uh, location, person, site alert that made it easier to build something quickly up front. Um, and then, like I say, if there were more requirements that came along during other ways, we could work that in then or possibly after um, they actually launched all their sites and then became like a support client. You know, some basic views listings of all those basic content types as well. Um, I'll discuss for a minute how we design these, these sites because um, it'll relate to how we integrate the same principles into the editing system. Um, rather than designing individual templates for each of our page, Promet leverages a component-based design system. This allows for a more flexible and reusable experience across UI and UX. And we've developed this into the site. This allows the devs to focus on building smaller reusable pieces rather than duplicating their effort across different pages. What you're seeing in this slide is how we work within a component-based design system to build elements and pages. The initial site guide will provide direction for needed elements that will, prefer, that will, further, that will be further developed to customize components that will make up templates um, and then pages that can be used in a blueprint for content. Um, teams to put together. During the development, we built out uh, each of the components individually and then embedded them into our structured pages like the news events, um, location, and things like that. But um, as you'll see on the next slide, we also use these components on more of our more flexible landing type pages. So for both of these platforms, we built a landing page content type that would utilize these flexible building block components to the fullest. The counties gain versatility here by using the components in many different ways to enable content editors to freely shape and rearrange the website without the help of developers. To this day, this allows them to have endless possibilities of templated pages that are brand compliant and available to their staff whose primary role isn't always to create these pages. This allows for an easy to use site building tool without compromising brand quality. Okay, so for Orange County, we use Layout Builder and custom block types uh, to accomplish these uh, landing pages. We've built a fairly robust uh, list of common components that content builders can use, um, banners, accordions, tabs, cards, uh, et cetera, et cetera as well as special groups like um, a number group, a photo gallery, and a link group, which could be used in lots of ways to show groups of cards using inline content blocks or actually referencing nodes in the system. Um, as a side note, what we built for Orange County was the start of something um, we've been working on since then and that we have since named Provis. Um, Basically, what Provis is is like a starter kit for um, a content editing system that we feel like works pretty well for a, a lot of our clients. Um, we've incorporated a lot more things since Orange County, um, like using Layout Builder Browser and section libraries to save sections or use them on other pages. We've adjusted the theming of the Layout Builder a little bit. Um, you can find out more about that if you stop by the booth. You can spin up your own copy of the government version that we have um, developed right now. For Riverside, um, since this work came to us um, with Site Studio, Acquia Site Studio, also in the contract, that's what we used. Uh, we employed the same techniques as we did for Orange County, although we used um, components inside of Site Studio instead of custom block types. Uh, just a note, this was our first Site Studio project, so we had lots of learning throughout the project. Uh, all in all, it was really interesting, basically hardly ever touching the IDE while you're working on the entire project. Um, but we built very similar components in the, um, to use when they're building landing pages. Um, banners, cards, uh, things like that. Um, but we also um, got to use, we got to leverage other components that Site Studio brings to us, like um, container components that you can drop 
other container components inside of, um, so that was cool. Um, there's also lots of other nice features that editors get inside Studio, like duplicating components and once again, saving components into a library. So for the designs and the theming of the platform, um, we, uh, Amy brought up earlier that uh, both counties were looking for a cohesive brand across all their, their county sites. They didn't want to look them, make them look exactly the same, but they both kind of had previous versions where the sites didn't really look like they belonged together. So that was a main design focus, was to get them kind of branded similarly throughout the site. Uh, so the way we designed that was first of all, designing uh, one enterprise level theme, including all the components. Then we came back and made tweaks to the other uh, theme variations um, with like small font choice uh, changes or changes to some of the colors. Uh, so that we could offer the individual department, department sites a choice of a set number of theme color variations. That gave the sites a bit of individuality, all the while staying brand cohesive. And together with the landing pages that we talked about and components, um, this allowed them to look completely different from each other. So how we implemented that technically for Orange County was actually pretty simple and straightforward. We just use one theme, and that helps us for a little bit easier maintenance uh, of the theme. Then we provided just a simple con uh, configuration form that they could switch between the, um, the different variations that the, the site would use. Um, and then we had a, an attachment hook that loaded up extra CSS that basically just overrode certain parts of the CSS that was changing. For Riverside, since this was a site studio, this was a bit more complicated. Um, but in the end, I thought it was pretty neat how we built it. Um, we used the style guides feature uh, in site studio to build variables. So you build all these variables and that we knew were going to change uh, between the theme variations. So we just identified the places in the theme variations that, that were changing. We built variables for those things. We use those variables inside of each component and template. And then um, rather than using like hard-coded values, then it was as simple as setting those colors for each variation. So that's the, the second screen over there on your right. Your base, that's the UI inside of the appearance of the theme that let you choose different color variations uh, for each of these variables. We didn't really let them do that, but we had like a set, um, we had the set colors on our end that we would insert and we'd save that YAML file and we just import it into whatever site we're using. So anyway, it worked out pretty well, I think. And uh, yeah. So for the migration side of this, um, Um, so we decided to use a perhaps different approach uh, than maybe we normally use for migrations, uh, but I think it worked pretty well for both of them. Um, normally our migrations would use a database or some type of export file as the source for the migration efforts, but in both these cases, we use something we call the migrate scraper tool. Um, much credit is due to Aaron Couch he was previously with Promet in the essay on the Orange County project when we uh, built this. Um, so the issue for Orange County was that for technical and maybe kind of political reasons, they would not give us the actual database for the entire uh, Orange County uh, site set of sites. Um, they had their reasons why they couldn't. So Aaron came up with this idea of scraping the HTML off the sites. Uh, so he deserves a lot of credit for coming up with the idea and actually building out the tool, which I think pretty much 90% he did that. Um, and then we ended up reusing that for Riverside uh, because for Riverside, um, we had sites in all lots of different platforms. Some were actually Drupal, 
The ones in Drupal. Yes, sir. We'll get to it. <laughs> um, um, anyway, for Riverside, there were some Drupal sites which we did just regular Drupal to Drupal migrations for. The rest of them, we relied on the Migrate Scraper because we bid, had built it and we're trying to see if we can reuse it. And we've actually used it a couple more times since then. Um, the benef one of the benefits, I guess, of the tool over a database approach is that we can limit what content we actually pull over to be what is currently live on their sites, which is maybe more valuable content uh, because it's not a bunch of outdated content sitting in the database that someone has to like delete. So how does it work? Um, well, first we start by crawling the entire site ourselves with some sort of spidering software to get a list of uh, URLs. We then get that list of URLs to the client as the first UAT checkpoint we were talking about. Um, then they can add or remove anything in the list. Uh, sorry, they can add URLs or remove URLs out of the list depending on their needs. They can also maybe look at um, their analytics to see if any of these certain user URLs are, are valuable enough to bring over. So that's the starting point, I guess. Then we scrape, we start using the scraper. To your point, it ingests the entire page, but then a lot of what the scraper is kind of doing is targeting different elements on the page that we can grab relevant information off that page, the, the relevant information for that content type. Um, so uh, we then process the data to do a few things. We gather other assets that we need to download, like images and documents. Uh, we, ch we change the links to those assets to use like Drupal paths. Um, we do some other data massaging to strip out inline styles and other specific things when necessary. In the end, what is created here are JSON files of data. Then it's on to Drupal and we employ the migrate API. We use the, the files JSON file to create files and uh, media entities. We use um, a directory of these pages for JSON files to create nodes uh, and to create redirects from the original URLs to these new nodes. Um, and then some, uh, we did some menu migration things as well. Um, some of them, for Orange County, they actually had a XML uh, file that was available for all the sites that we use that a lot of the time. Um, we also developed a, uh, like a, a, a spreadsheet to where people could fill out like a new URL structure, like a menu structure if they wanted to use that and we used that to match up with the, the data that was coming in. Yes, ma'am. So you're saying uh, the difference of page flow was during the UAT when they said this page is already in this one realm, this is the one that was used. Is it just with the page level or were they able to indicate areas on the page where you don't want that to be well in UAT that may be Oh, okay. So like that page is hit a lot, their analytics say it's hit a lot, but they don't interact with this one section in this particular area. Sure. Okay, so the question is, uh, do they have any more places to like exclude certain data off of the page other than just like the whole URL? Um, there's a bunch of override kind of things and um, transformations that that Aaron had built into the uh, scraper to give us more options to do similar things like that. But basically it's, it's um, yeah, it's more of options that we're trying to put into the tool to help us filter certain things out. And this is like a tool that was created for a certain purpose. Um, it's completely external to Drupal right now. We've used it a couple times. I think probably the next steps for this tool is we'll probably get it into Drupal. Another big thing that we've done recently, we haven't really used it for a client yet, is um, right now we're just identifying pretty specific things like 
pretty specific node type fields like titles and bodies and dates and things like that, pretty easy things to grab. But um, we also have like a proof of concept of looking at a scrape or a uh, legacy page with landing page type components on it and basically identifying, you know, that's a banner. We're gonna we're gonna map that thing over to a banner. We're gonna get the title and the the image and things like that for that banner um, from these elements and so that we can actually take a landing page type page that's not just a WYSIWYG thing and pull it over into Layout Builder with our custom block types. So that's maybe a future iteration that we're working on. Um, I think that's it on the, on the main section of that. I wanted to talk a little bit about project management. We hit on some of this earlier when we were discussing the project plan. Um, we really have found that a lot of the common problems associated with projects of this size are managed by our highly skilled PM team. They're awesome. If you got to meet them last year, you know. Um, but some of the th the, the key items to keep in mind for us. Um, like I said, we hit on this a little bit earlier, but having dedicated roles from the beginning of the project and a dedicated schedule will really help keep everything aligned. Um, so we were able to work with the project management, project management teams at the county levels as, as well as their sponsors at the county level to ensure that, for example, if we realized one department was gonna take a little longer than we thought, we could substitute it out with another one in that wave concept that we were talking about. So we're not pushing any waves out. We're able to replace departments with others during that initial smaller discovery session and util utilize a lot of what we did in the initial discovery to help push things forward for each subsequent wave. Um, and uh, I think the, the UAT milestones um, can often be a big, one of the bigger hurdles, um, making sure that the schedules are aligned at the very outset so that we're accounting for holidays and random off days that <laughs> counties are closed on a Friday and we're expecting feedback on a Friday. Just making sure that we're aligned on, on those kind of things. The project management team it just really plays a huge role in keeping the project on task. And this is a quote from our project management counterpart at Orange County. Um, he was a huge part in enabling um, the success of the project and really helped not only us keep the project on task, but also to coordinate with all the different teams and all the different departments on the county side to bring it to fruition. And some lessons learned on the county side, we received these directly from our clients. Um, creating the governing body that I've just discussed in order to expedite approval processes and ensure that the right people are involved with those approvals was critical um, to keeping the projects on task. It's also a common misconception um, is what we were told that only the IT folks should be involved and we've experienced this as well. In fact, they really encouraged having participants um, such as the communications director, marketing ex executives, um, and other key players that would really be interacting a lot more with the site than they're maybe necessarily always given credit for and that's gonna help really build a much better end product for the client. Um, Structuring the information architecture from an internal perspective is one of the, the items that was highlighted by one of our project managers on the client side. 
they had started down that path and realized that they were speaking to themselves and not their viewers. <laughs> Both are important. Um, but if the goal is to ease the use for the user, which will then also ease the, the communication on the side of the county and efficiencies on the side of the county because they're not getting in as many phone calls and questions, um, it's really important to focus on that. Um, and there's multiple ways we can do that. Um, but that was something that they really took away as a lesson learned was to make sure they were foc focusing a little bit more externally than they had been originally. And the other piece I think that was a key takeaway for um, counties that we've received is, um, as we've mentioned a few times, do the hard work at the beginning. So you know, we said we spent a little extra time on the first waves that we would do and that was key to the success of the upcoming waves and the additional departments um, to get the base structure of everything out of the way and kind of some of the politics out of the way at the beginning of the project when fewer potential errors can be <laughs> achieved that way. Um, from the agency side, some of the main lessons learned for us um, was that having the sponsor and the PM on the client side um, and having one of those two individuals being key decision makers um, really um, helped maintain the efficiency of the project um, and the expediency. And they were also able to act as advocates within the different departments for moving the project along and making sure that all of the milestones were being met on their side as well as ours. Um, and, yeah? I want to ask the best person. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'd like to have fun, okay. too, so. <laughs> we have a lot of pets. In <laughs> so we do enjoy sharing pictures of our pets, and they often come on screen without <laughs> our intention. <laughs> we only yeah. uh, develop with pets involved. <laughs> there must be a cat or dog on your lap at all times. <laughs> um, but no, thank you for noticing. We'll tell the pets you said hello. Um, the, the, another big item, though, is having retros internally. Um, we actually include our clients in some of the retros as well. Um, so we have both internal and shared retros. Um, but those are invaluable within the project after each wave to say, okay, how can we improve the next wave, especially on these larger projects? Um, but then also it helps us as a team at Promet to further develop our own processes to a more proficient manner manner when, you know, let's, we're brought a good idea and we will always try to take into account lessons learned um, both internally and from the client side. With that, I do want to open the floor for questions. I think your hand went up first. <laughs> Um, so the question was, how big was the team for these? Do you know how big e each team would have been? You're talking about on the ProMet side? Um, at the beginning, Orange County was a little smaller, maybe five people. Um, Riverside, I feel like we had a few more resources up front. Just a note on team size and relating to the retros she was talking about. The fact that we were retroing every, um, after every wave, we were trying to uh, hone in what our uh, steps are gonna be and what things we needed from each um, department as we went. We really honed that in, I think, because like towards the halfway point and on, we really only needed like a junior dev in the PM could really l run the rest of the waves. Um, like they would pull in other more senior people later on uh, if we if they were needed, but we had done the main work and um, we had the process well enough that we didn't need a bunch of resources towards like halfway through the project. Okay.
So for archive stuff, that's obviously not going to get it at all because we're talking about um, uh, publicly available URLs. So if, if that is a key, that tool is not going to work for you. It worked for us in these circumstances. I wouldn't say it's going to work for all circumstances. You're talking about dynamic content as far as Okay, so the logic, we're obviously not caring about the logic, but as long as the page is available and we can get to it, we can get it. <laughs> Does that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we start out by sp specifically stating this is a safe place. You can remain anonymous or you can, we can discuss if you have feedback on your specific point, um, but we never require anyone to reveal which points were theirs. Um, and we do keep it anonymous unless someone wants to volunteer that they're the ones that shared that feedback. Um, speaking to the first part, I think the ones that I've been involved in have, they've been, the customers have been pretty engaged, especially after the first one when they've realized that it's, it is a safe space and they don't have to worry about it. And, um, to the latter part, do you have anything? Tools? Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I think it improves every time, and but it's. I mean, f overall, I'd say we have good engagement. Okay. I think there was a, back here. I can try to talk to that. So the question is more about how we are addressing accessibility and how we're the governance about accessibility, especially probably more about the content that was migrated over afterwards. Um, and I think for both projects, like on our end, the components that we built were accessible. We made sure that the things that we were building were accessible. Um, from there, um, Basically, we ran a lot of reports for them, and they were running reports a lot as far as after the content got there, we would run through some accessibility things and then point them out to them that these things are um, need some tweaking, um, and we could help with that for uh, to a certain degree, but that's also going to be a little bit more on them as well to adjust some of their content. Um, coming from where they were over into the new system. There's gonna be some time in there where um, they could start to use the new system more than the old system, I guess. Some of the old markup that they're using, they could start using more components rather than inline tables with all kinds of crazy stuff for layout and things like that. Um, so it was more of a governance policy on each of them to like have strong reporting tools and like I know Orange County uses Site Improve quite a lot and they're constantly running reports and constantly getting alerts about things that people are creating. But yeah, there was, there was some issues they had to enforce um, as data was coming over. The, this, okay, so for Orange County, we actually used um, Storybook. 
to show a lot of these things to the client, like and like working components. Um, I don't believe Riverside. We did that. We we're basically just using Figma files or in design or uh, in Vision files at that point. Or did MK hosted them through, through those? Yes, stuff. we hosted the through the external sites. Just. Um, you know, I would say for Orange County, it was a pretty simple multi-site. Um, um, one, th uh, yeah, there wasn't anything crazy, I don't think, as far as setting up the multi-site for Orange County. Um, for, um, Riverside is slightly different because we're using Site Factory, and I think the one issue that I think we ran into a lot with them was that deployments um, of lots of websites took a long time. Uh, like just deploying a, a new tag to development would take a long time for it to stage these down into the area and rebuild them and push them back up. So that time involved during deployments was annoying, I guess, on our end. And we ne I'm not sure. I was out of the project at that point, so I'm not sure if we came up with solutions for that. Um, another thing that we actually did for both clients was, um, I mentioned for a second, we did uh, a solar search where both of them actually wanted a, at, the, at their main county site, so ocgov.com and rivco.org, they actually wanted to have search results from all the county sites in the, on that page, on that site, but all the other sites just wanted their individual uh, results on those pages or the ability to maybe search for both. Um, so the way we did that, I don't know why I'm bringing this up. I guess it's more about the multi-site, but uh, we didn't discuss it earlier. Um, we used one search core and we indexed everything for all the sites in this one core um, with machine names for each of the separate sites. So we just, just basically a views filter at that point. When we're on the main site, we can see everything, and then on the other separate sites, we're just limiting to that particular site. How did you test the, the content that was not edited? How did you test that? Did you A lot of QA, <laughs> and then we gave it to them to tell us if we missed more things, and then... Uh, I'm sorry, the question was, how did we test the migration to make sure that we weren't missing assets and files and images and URLs maybe, um, 404s? Um, the answer is we did a lot of QA on our end to test lots of pages to make sure we were getting everything. They were then tasked to do the same thing to make sure we weren't missing anything important as well as the last kind of third of the wave, they're kind of tasked with looking at this content and trying to beautify it, get it ready for launch. So they're also possibly finding things during that phase. Um, we also have uh, Dubbot involved usually um, with um, some of our accessibility testing. So it can find uh, 404s and, and missing things as well there. I feel like we did. I can't remember what we did. Like I said, the Migrate Scraper has a pretty good uh, starting point. From there, you can do more things with it to try to uh, filter things out or look for certain things like that. I feel like we did do something about that for Riverside, in, in fact, because uh, I know they had a lot of the same images showing up. And so I'm pretty sure we did something about it. I can't speak to <laughs> what it was right this second, but it was probably in the Migrate Scraper just doing some extra stuff for that particular department. Yes, sir. There was manual stuff 
I'm sorry, the question was, it was there time during either project that the scraper didn't really do what we wanted it to do? Um, was there manual things to do? There was always manual things to do, I guess. Like I said in the beginning, that, that there is that last phase that they're kind of beautifying things and massaging things, getting ready for launch. So there's always going to be some manual stuff. I think overall, the scraper did a great job for what we wanted it to do. Yeah, I would say 90%. Like, it, it did a pretty good job of getting the content over. Um, yeah. Um, I guess I'm not totally understanding the question. Uh, the question is about whether we can use the theme variation in a microsite and a multi-site implementation. Sure. Sorry, so for the modules that we used for the component things um, for Orange County, that's Layout Builder, and we created custom block types that were all those components, like a, a, a banner, a tab, a f uh, an accordion, or whatever. Those are all just custom block types. Um, for Riverside County, they're using Site Studio, and so everything is components inside of Site Studio. And like I said before, the Provis project uh, th thing that Orange County kind of started that road, uh, us on that road, that thing is available. You can spin it up and see all the components, or you can see how they're built. Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, we use Storybook for Orange County. We've since stopped using it, I guess primarily because for our needs, we're kind of a smaller team and it's, it kind of got in the way a little bit for us. It kind of slowed down some development time. We might try to you know, incorporate it back in in a future version, but right now we're not 